Ah, UHF, the best Weird Al Yankovic movie of all time. To be fair, there's only two, but hey, it's still good to be the best of two. So many people talk about why this movie's so great, but very few people seem to know how it became great. Trust me, it was not an easy path. So let me tell you all about the complete history of UHF. By the way, an extra special thank you to Kev Messick, the Patreon raffle winner for this month. If you too would like your idea for a Media Mementos video to come to life, then stay tuned till the end of the video and I'll tell you how. Let me set the stage. It was 1985. Weird Al's second album, In 3D, had just come out to some positive reception. Now that Weird Al Yankovic had successfully conquered the music world, he and manager Jay Levy felt that it was finally time for Al to conquer... THE MOVIE WORLD! Simply put, whatever movie they were going to make was going to be a vehicle to help catapult Weird Al into superstardom, rather than the cult novelty status he was at now. Keeping in tune with what made Al popular... Eh, in tune, get it? The movie wouldn't exactly be narrative-driven, but would instead be all about parodying whatever was popular at the time, as well as local low-budget entertainment and the underhanded side of network affiliates. They would end up coming up with the concept of a young man named George, played by none other than Weird Al Yankovic himself, <laughs> finding himself in charge of a rundown television studio, taking it from the brink of bankruptcy all the way to number one. We're number one. Say what? Ah! The first draft was written by Al and Levy by hand, and was a whopping 232 pages. Yeah, they knew that if they wanted this to get picked up by a studio, they had to do some trimming. Once the script to this film, now known as UHF, was finally finished, Yankovic and Levy began pitching this around to studios, only to be met with indifference at best. That's so weird. No, it's not. Weird Al wasn't a big enough celebrity yet for studios to turn their heads, and the concept sounded, well, frankly, ridiculous. So nobody was willing to take a chance on them, until the script for UHF found its way into the hands of Darren Getz, Kevin Breslin, and Gene Kirkwood. They loved what they saw. They sat the duo down and told them that in a month, they'd be shooting the movie. What Yankovic and Levy thought was a joke turned out to be a reality. Those three that they met with were very close with the fledgling Orion Pictures. Unbeknownst to Yankovic and Levy, they were looking for their next big hit. Now, it's not that Orion Pictures was in mortal peril or anything, but with the exception of a few outliers like, say, Robocop... Thank you for your cooperation. The success of their movies would range from, yeah, that did okay, to losing them a lot of money. Naturally, they were looking for somebody to help turn things around. And who better to help them get out of the steady financial decline than the guy who sang Ryer the Kaiser? Despite how much faith they had in UHF, they were only willing to give it a $5 million budget. Don't spend it all in one place. Orion's business model was basically go for quantity over quality, funding several movies that would come out throughout the year, but only giving them minuscule budgets. Yankovic and Levy didn't care. If it meant that UHF finally got to be made, then they'd take the deal. It's not like they had any other deals to consider anyways. I've got all the cash right here. And as soon as you sign these, we can start celebrating. So the contracts were signed, the hands were shaken, and the deal was final. Unfortunately, Yankovic had to decline a spot on Michael Jackson's European tour to make this movie. And uh, depending on who you ask, that may or may not have been the right decision. But anyways, now that production was underway, UHF needed a director. And that director turned out to be none other than Jay Levy himself. Sources conflict on whether no other director wanted to take the movie, or if the duo didn't trust anyone else with it. Honestly, I can believe both, but it doesn't really matter the specifics. All that mattered is that Weird Al felt that Levy was the right man for the job. He himself wasn't up to directing it, so it may as well be the next best thing. The guy who knew his weirdness perfectly well, but who also wasn't busy with the lead role. Obviously, the role of George Newman would be played by Weird Al Yankovic, 
But what about the rest of the cast? Victoria Jackson was given the role of Terry, George's no-nonsense girlfriend, beating out other stars like Ellen DeGeneres and Jennifer Tilly. When are you going to start taking things a little more seriously? Film veteran Kevin McCarthy, no, not that Kevin McCarthy, there you go, was a veteran of the silver screen, and thus was an expert with comedic timing. He could be threatening when he wanted to be, he could be smooth when he wanted to be, who better to play the slimy antagonist, R.J. Fletcher? Hey, R.J. Hi, George Newman, U62. Fran Drescher came in to read for the part of the newscaster Pamela Taylor, later renamed to Pamela Finkelstein. Pamela Finkelstein. And she had barely read her section of the script before she was given the role. Upon hearing her initial delivery, Yankovic knew that they couldn't get anybody better. You just gotta know how to talk to those guys. Philo, U62's chief engineer, was originally offered to Joel Hodgson. Joel Hodgson, age 23, white human, Minneapolis, Minnesota, <laughs> starting now. Yes, the same Joel Hodgson that would later create Mystery Science Theater 3000. But since Hodgson was taking a break from showbiz, he turned them down. Instead, the role went to soap opera star Anthony Geary. The crew wasn't exactly excited to have Geary audition. They mostly let him come in just to be nice. But then, lo and behold, he read the part and blew everybody away. Today, we're going to learn to make plutonium from common household items. John Paragon auditioned for several roles, and while everybody loved him, they didn't quite have a place for him since he didn't seem to fit into any of the lead roles. Eventually, though, he was given the role of R.J. Fletcher's son, Richard, and then the rest, as they say, was history. Aww, did I do that? David Bowe, not to be confused with David Bowie, was able to perfectly capture the straight man energy that Yankovic was looking for, and according to Levy, he was also cast because he wasn't too tall. For some reason, he wanted Yankovic to be the taller of the duo? Uh, okay? Something that may surprise those who've seen the movie is that the most auditioned for character was the bum. Change the gut change! Yeah, the manic, toothless guy that appears in three scenes? People were flocking to play him. Vance Kovic Jr. got the part, and dang did he nail it. It's a Rolex, see? Crispin Glover came in to audition, but the only character he wanted to play was the bit part Crazy Ernie. Hey, Crazy Ernie! Where'd you get all those cars? Nobody really saw him as Ernie material, so sorry Crispin, no UHF for you. All this is fine and good, but it feels like we're missing somebody, aren't we? You can talk, you can talk, you can talk your brain now, Oh yeah, that's right, Stanley Spadowski. Stanley Spadowski. Stanley Spadowski. Stanley Spadowski, world's greatest janitor and TV star. The role was written for Michael Richards, who at the time was a big hit on the show Fridays, and whom Weird Al was a big fan of. <laughs> Unfortunately, upon receiving the script, Richards had his agent reach out to Orion and say, yeah, he's not interested, but thanks. But that no didn't matter. Yankovic and Levy knew that Richards was the only guy for the part. Except for Christopher Lloyd, that is, but they all knew that wouldn't happen. I love Chinese restaurants. <laughs> Eventually, Richards was worn down enough to come in and audition. He didn't read from the script. Instead, he put in some false teeth, the same ones that were later used in the final movie, and just decided to be Stanley. Now, there are some conflicting stories here saying that he loved the script at first but then was too busy, or that he never liked it but just did it for money, or that he wasn't a big fan of the script and just liked Weird Al. We don't really know what was going through Michael Richards' head, but judging from what we know about him now, as well as his reaction to Weird Al asking him what his initial thoughts on the script were in the director's commentary, it's safe to say that he wasn't a big fan of UHF. Um, I liked it, because I'm a fan of Al Yankovic. I, was, I, I love what the, he does, all the lampoonery with the, with the music and so forth, so I said, this will be terrific. Nevertheless, he agreed to take the role, and thus the cast was complete. 
at least in terms of the major cast. We're friends. Years later, Yankovic would describe how it was difficult to fill characters who had minor roles. There would be some celebrity cameos planned out for characters like Big Edna or the helicopter booth operator, but they would never pan out. Partially because the film wasn't exactly a hot commodity, and also because that $5 million budget could only get them so far. Don't spend it all in one place. It was the equivalent of doing a medium-sized road trip on a single tank of gas. You could do it, but you had to spend everything you had perfectly. Otherwise, everything would go up in flames. This was the leading factor in the crew deciding that the film would be shot not in Los Angeles, not in San Francisco, but Tulsa, Oklahoma. The scenery was nice, nobody was filming there, and of course, it was cheap. It also didn't hurt that executive producer Gray Fredrickson grew up there and could personally vouch for how well it could serve the film. Fredrickson, by the way, had previously helped Francis Ford Coppola out on two movies that he filmed in Tulsa, those being The Outsiders and Rumblefish. Sure enough, upon scouting Tulsa out, the crew found that there were several great possibilities, like having the shopping mall be the setting for U-62 in the interior of Channel 8, or having the Hewlett Packard building be the exterior for Channel 8, so on and so forth. Once Yankovic finished his two-week acting course with Michael Lembeck at the producer's request, UHF had officially begun shooting. Because the producers thought that I should, you know, just suck a little bit, not suck completely. Once they got there, the cast and crew were heralded as heroes by the people of Tulsa. Finally, a celebrity is choosing their city to make a movie. One that was surely going to be a big hit. Whatever they wanted, Tulsa would provide. One of the main things that the Tulsa residents were able to provide were themselves. Since the budget was small, they could only afford to use extras sparingly in certain shots. These would be in, say, the bar or Stanley Spadowski's clubhouse. If the scene didn't need extras, then they didn't go in. But do you remember those bit parts that I mentioned earlier? The ones that Yankovic and Levy wanted to fill with celebrities? Well, since the budget wouldn't allow for the likes of Sylvester Stallone, they settled with local Tulsa talent. Even though they weren't the flashy names that the crew had hoped for, they were always happy with the results. They would also have the crew members double up as extras from time to time. After all, it did save money. But even so, the people of Tulsa were happy to be extras, provide props like Stanley's train set, or to go on makeshift studio tours to show some support during shooting. And I do mean during shooting. They would often have these tours while scenes were going on. Not only were the people of Tulsa friendly, but the cast and crew got along really well. For the most part. According to several on-set reports, Kevin McCarthy was the life of the party. As soon as the cameras would go off, he would shed his nasty, grumpy demeanor and would become his normal, happy, jolly self. Everybody became friends, the chemistry was on point, and almost everybody had a great time. The one exception, of course, being Michael Richards. In case you haven't seen my old video on Michael Richards, or in case you haven't heard the many horror stories about him, as great of a comedic actor as he might be, Michael Richards is notoriously difficult to work with. Everything in a scene has to be done right and right now. He's no nonsense, he doesn't laugh very much, and this grumpy behavior would not serve him well on the set of a comedy movie made by this guy. In my own humble opinion, I think this movie is even funnier than Fatal Attraction. But he didn't care. This is strange considering that out of everybody involved in UHF, Weird Al Yankovic included, Michael Richards was given the most creative freedom. What do you say, kids? Can we do it? There would be whole sections in the script that were left blank so that Michael Richards could do whatever he wanted. And I guess that just wasn't good enough. Yeah, I wouldn't put anything past that guy. To be fair, though, he might not have been able to enjoy himself all that much considering that UHF was on a tight schedule. Shooting had to be done in six weeks. That, combined with the already minuscule budget, meant that takes would have to be kept at a minimum in order to preserve film. The tight schedule also meant that the props that were made had to be approved minutes before being used. 
The one exception being the fish on the wheel. wheel. What happened there was that the fish were bought ahead of time, then sat under a bunch of studio lights, baking and rotting, causing the room to reek. What better scene to place those contest winners in, am I right? Yeah, UHF had a big star in Weird Al Yankovic's first feature-length movie contest. And yeah, this is where they put the extras. I mean, now it's regarded as the most classic scene in the movie, but at the time, would it really be worth it? The answer is, of course, yes. Please, as my gift, accept this fish. Despite the script being already set in stone, there were many aspects that were added last minute. Oh, hi. Like Yankovic throwing grapes into David Bowe's mouth, they were doing that on break and thought, hey, why not put this in the movie? Or how's about the scene where George was trying to feed Punch to a dog? The dog was supposed to go on the table and start dancing, but they couldn't get it to do what they wanted, so instead it was just dropped in the punch bowl. Which, personally, I think is much funnier. Everything was going smoothly until it was time to shoot the telethon scenes. This required so many extras in order to be convincing. Extras that the budget did not allow for whatsoever. So instead, Yankovic started a guerrilla marketing campaign around Tulsa, saying that if you came to be an extra on set, you can take part in a contest where you can win all sorts of prizes. None of which would involve cash, of course, but still, you'd possibly get something. Authorities were none too happy with Yankovic's attempt to get people to quote-unquote work for free. So, thinking quickly, Weird Al said, Oh no, we're not using the people, we're just using their cars. They can leave, but we'll still need their cars on set. And of course, everybody would need their cars in order to leave, meaning that the extras had nowhere to go. Sure enough, the loophole worked. And thus, the Tulsa filming had wrapped up. But unfortunately, during this time, tragedy struck the set. Trinidad Silva, who played Raul of Raul's Wild Kingdom fame, was killed by a drunk driver in July of 1988. Everybody was devastated. They loved this guy, and of course, the way he went was definitely tragic. They didn't have much time to mourn since they were already behind schedule. But still, there was a problem they needed to address. Silva hadn't finished his scenes yet. What were they going to do? Could they recast him, cut him out of the movie altogether? Or just leave everything as is? They decided to go with option three and dedicated the movie to Silva's memory. They just couldn't cut him out of the movie or replace him because, well, he was their friend. This was going to be his final job, so why not share it with the world? Three badgers. Badgers? Badgers? We don't need no stinking badgers! Once they had made that decision, it was on to finish the rest of the shots. The remaining fantasy sequences, mainly the opening scene parodying Indiana Jones, were shot in the Intravision studio in Los Angeles. One of the final things to be done in UHF was the music video. It was a weird trend at the time that movies would randomly cut to music videos. And hey, Weird Al Yankovic is a musician, so it kinda fit. The song selected was originally going to be a parody of Prince's song, Let's Go Crazy. But Prince, who wasn't exactly a fan of Weird Al Yankovic, said no. So it was back to the drawing board. Though Yankovic didn't have to think all too hard about what he would do. Back in his college days, he would sing a parody of Rolling Stone's Missing You combined with the theme song to the Beverly Hillbillies. Listen to my story about a man named Chad, a poor mountaineer barely kept his family fed. A poor mountaineer barely kept his family fed. <laughs> he would do something like that, albeit with a more current song, such as Dire Straits' Money for Nothing. You know something that poor mountaineer, they say he barely kept his family Rick Morris, who was the editor on Weird Al's first music video, Ricky, did the animation, perfectly capturing the style of the original, and the guitarist was none other than Mark Knopfler, the writer of the original song. That's the way you do it. He said that the only way he would allow Weird Al to parody his song in UHF was if he got to be the guitarist in the recording. Sounds like a pretty cool guy. And once these had wrapped up, UHF was officially done, asterisk.
Yeah, the filming was done, and they did it pretty quickly, but they still had a long, arduous editing process ahead. Thankfully, Orion Pictures had little to no involvement with the editing process whatsoever. In fact, they mostly kept themselves distant from Yankovic and the crew. They had a couple of notes here and there, most notably trying to get the shop scene with Emo Phillips removed, but nothing major or anything that they had to dig in their heels for. Really, they were as supportive as they could be. So much so that they did something that Orion rarely ever does. They raised the budget. You're the guy that gave me that 1955 double-dyed guinea. That thing was worth a fortune. Granted, this was only because UHF ran out of money during the editing process. So, yeah, it was either that or get no movie at all. Speaking of this editing process, not only did they have to piece the movie and the score together, but they also had to shave tons of scenes off the final cut. Their current version of UHF was bloated and didn't have a proper structure, so there would be tons of exposition scenes that would hit the cutting room floor, such as Uncle Harvey trying to convince George to take the station, or George trying to get a loan from the bank, but that still wasn't enough. There would have to be other jokes and whole characters removed. There would even be whole subplots that were cut from the final film. Most notably, the scenes where one of R.J. Fletcher's henchmen is terrified of bugs. There used to be a whole subplot about bugs. <laughs> the rule was, if it wasn't funny enough, if it had too much exposition, and or it didn't go anywhere, it had to go. Finally, after an arduous editing process, UHF was finally completed. Now all Orion had to do was release it to some test audiences and come back with some notes. And in doing so, Orion ensured that UHF was doomed to fail. Oh, I just don't know what's wrong with me! So what's for dinner? It's not that UHF didn't do well in test screenings. Far from it. It was some of the best responses they've ever gotten. The problem was... Upon seeing all this positive feedback, Orion got a little too confident that UHF would be a success, so they decided to release it in the middle of the summer blockbuster season of 1989, thinking that Weird Al alone would be able to sell tickets. It was released along the likes of Lethal Weapon 2, Dead Poet Society, Batman 1989, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, and Ghostbusters 2. Yeah, that wasn't gonna work. Orion didn't see it that way. They thought this movie would be big. Big all over the world at that. We better do it fast. The only problem was the title UHF wouldn't exactly work in most foreign markets. Knowing this, Yankovic suggested the name The Vidiot for international releases. Orion decided to call it The Vidiot from UHF. Wasn't the whole point of changing the title removing UHF? Okay. Before UHF was officially released, Orion was touting Weird Al Yankovic as their next comedic star. Their own Woody Allen. The next Woody Allen, if you will. Okay, first Orion pitches Weird Al Yankovic as the new Woody Allen, and then later CBS would pitch him as the new Pee Wee Herman. Here's a thought, don't pitch Weird Al as the new anything. It never works out. Much to Orion's surprise, Weird Al Yankovic's name wasn't strong enough yet to compete against the likes of Robin Williams or Harrison Ford. It grossed just over $6 million, barely making back its $5 million budget, but then factoring in things like advertising, this film broke even at best. Critics didn't like it either, but Yankovic shrugged this off as, hey, UHF is just not a critic movie. And plus, it's clear that a lot of critics just didn't get it. It adds up to a 1 out of 10. UHF stands for Ugly Hunk of Film. UHF was only in theaters for two weeks before being pulled. Once Orion saw the box office results, that was it. UHF had to get out of there at once. And all future projects with Weird Al were officially dead. This movie also somewhat damaged Weird Al's career. Because he wasn't actively producing music at this time, unless you count the poor selling UHF soundtrack, he wasn't keeping current enough and his star was starting to fade. He was having a difficult time getting people to pick up the phone. 
He wasn't able to make a big hit until he got Victoria Jackson of all people to help him get in touch with Kurt Cobain, and thus he was able to make Smells Like Nirvana and was officially back on the map. As for UHF itself, it may not have done well in theaters, but it was a big hit on home video. That is, until it went out of print in 1996, once Orion went out of business. Orion, Orion is bankrupt now. For the longest time, it was one of those cases of keep circulating the tapes or you're never gonna see this movie again. During this time of UHF being nearly inaccessible to the general public, Weird Al Yankovic was making The Weird Al Show. Here, he decided to bring back as many cast members as he could, minus Michael Richards, in order to appease the fans who wanted a UHF too. Fan demand was able to bring the VHS and DVD into print, and UHF was able to earn its status as a cult classic, to this day being considered one of the best comedy films of all time in certain circles. I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say that this is perhaps the greatest movie ever made in the history of mankind. It sure took a while, but UHF was finally able to become a success. I hope that to everybody involved, it was all worth it in the end. While Yankovic is still proud of the movie today, he wishes that the film was more of a parody of the tropes that were going on at the time, rather than just pop culture in general. We would later see this come to life in his parody biopic, Weird. We're um, playing a little gig next week called Live Aid. So yes, that is the history of UHF. What more can I say except just wow. Alright, on to the outro. Well, folks, thanks for watching the video. What'd you guys think? What do you think of UHF, and what do you think is the craziest thing that happened behind the scenes? Comment below and let me know, because I'm always excited to hear what you guys have to say. And now, it's time to thank our wonderful Patreon people, starting with our Masters of Fate. Chan11, Drew the Stew, Kev Messick, Platinum Bass, Quiet Chap, Ryan Williams, Timey, Toko Blahuvian, and Woody Woo. And now, for our executive producers, Albert Robinson, Blackjack, H.R. Hoffman, Indiscreet One, Kurt Bruenning, Leaf Storm, Ravioli Supremo, Unkale, and who else but Zane? If you two would like your name read at the end of every Media Mementos video, then why not consider donating to the Patreon? There's a link in the description below for you to check out. Also, there's a link to the Media Mementos Twitter and Discord server, so stop on by and say hello. Alright folks, thanks for watching the video, and I'll see you guys next time. That's it everybody, thanks for watching, keep in touch. Goodbye, 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 goodbye. 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 goodbye.